I've been to the factories where they're pouring aluminum. I wasn't completely proud of it. Um, and so I felt um, dirty, but I'd been uh, ignited now. And now when I look at uh, free market and business, I'm like, there is no other way to be except to have ethics in business. What I want to talk about is um, my story as a rule breaker and um, uh, when I was young, what that looked like, which meant um, court systems, uh, foster homes, um, a brother was a crack addict, spent time in jail. Uh, but what I learned there and um, becoming an entrepreneur at 17, because at 17 or 16 is when everything just flipped for me. And, um, and I see that sort of being centered out as the problem kid, being dragged out of class in front of everybody, um, being embarrassed in front of large groups of people and being able to come back afterwards with some sense of dignity. Entrepreneurship's hard. We take chances and we fail, and now I'm okay with failure. Um, well, it's not failure, it's just falling down. A study came out of entrepreneurs recently that uh, just really made me happy to know I was a problem child, um, and I became an entrepreneur because what the study showed was that uh, in their youth, most entrepreneurs were rebellious, uh, skipped school, I see some, uh, stole, <laughs> fought, okay, I didn't make up the study, they just studied 40-something <laughs> year olds and they said, hey, what was your youth like? and this type of stuff came out. And that made me feel not so alone because um, that's what got me interested in going, hey, wait a second, being a troubled child is leading some of us towards entrepreneurship. Um, we need to look into this because there's a lot of kids in school right now that don't feel like they fit in, that they don't feel like they belong, that they're at the back of the class and they're not getting the marks like everybody else. So my story and, uh, and how I come to be standing here is uh, my dad's from Jamaica. And he took a risk when he was young and went to England and met my awesome mom. And they had my two older brothers came to Toronto. And I'm not sure how my mom had me, but um, that fat little kid made it. <laughs> um, in my uh, community, um, I don't know, kind of seems to be the way with a lot of Jamaicans. And my dad left um, soon after. So my mom had to raise a white woman raising three black kids in um, government subsidized housing uh, in Toronto. This neighborhood here, Jane and Finch, is one of the most notorious uh, neighborhoods. And this is where me and my brothers um, grew up. And uh, we were no exception to what was happening there. By the age of eight, I'd already been in front of a judge uh, three times, um, which knew my mom by name at that point and my two older brothers. Um, Grade two, I had a ferocious temper. It was so bad that I was hauled out of class and locked in a room with a punching doll to take out my, because I would just like lose it and grab whatever little kids sitting beside me during show and tell. Show and tell and then the, um, Grade four, it was getting even worse. They just uh, you know, sent me home if I acted out. It wasn't even like, it's like, nope, done, out. Um, one of those trips home, um, I'm a little kid living. <laughs> And the townhouse here, I couldn't get in my place. I actually fell through the window and cut my side open and ended up in the hospital. Um, now, I look back, my brothers beat the crap out of me all the time, and, and I think that's where my temper came from. But it couldn't be contained. And finally, Children's Aid Society took me away to live in a foster home for a year. It sounds pretty bad so far, but it, it turns around. Um, <laughs> But it was on a farm. And this was an incredible experience, because I was the only black kid at this uh, foster home at the school, and it's a farm. It's probably the whole district, the only non-white kid. Great lesson, though. It helped me be able to stand out and not need to fit in with people as I move through life. That was one of those early lessons. Um, but school just kind of went like that for me. That was my childhood. My brother was a full-on uh, crack addict. He was a thief for a living, like purse snatching, breaking into apartments at night while people were sleeping. And they got to the point where they would like rock, paper, scissors for who got to go into the bedroom and actually go through the pockets for wallets and stuff. That's the kind of game that they played. Um, not, they're not all alive right now. But, uh, but my brother is an entrepreneur who since went on to sort of create a security device to stop people like him from getting in apartments. <laughs> 
Um, in high school at the age of 16, my life changed. This after school business program, Junior Achievement, I decided to check it out. Um, and what it is is like, I don't know, hundreds of kids, they put you in groups of 25, and then they tell you you're going to start a, a business, like a real business. You got to raise money, uh, elect officers, and all that stuff. And in our first meeting, these 25 kids elected me as the president. Now, I was a loser kid. I talked too much. I talked too loud. No one wanted me around. I've been taken away. I've been sent away. And here I've got people that are like, hey, can you steer this ship? That was a pivotal moment for me. And it's one that I, I think about all the time because I shifted from being a kid who couldn't care less about school. And within a semester or two, I was on the honor roll. And what I was realizing what was happening is I wasn't letting the world tell me what to do. That's what I was building all this time. You don't tell me what to do. But what I saw is when I wanted to do it, I couldn't be stopped. That was an amazing moment for me. So now I started my first venture. By 17, I, I don't know why I started a fence and deck company. And another lesson, you don't need to know what you're doing in order to go do something. I had no idea how to build fences. I helped my friend and his dad build one. But I didn't let lack of knowledge stop me. Um, ended up with five employees. That's part, my brother, who used to beat me up all the time, I was on my payroll. So that was a really good feeling. The spark uh, was lit. I was really into snowboarding um, back in the uh, early 80s. Any snowboarders here? Anyone? So I was near the beginning of snowboarding. Um, yeah, in the 80s when they were made out of wood. And I um, ended up starting a company um, from an idea. I had my first invention was to make a locking device for snowboards. Um, my company is called Bakoda. Uh, and as the years went on, um, well, by 25, I ended up having a factory. I had almost 30 employees. Uh, and we were making snowboard products for all these companies around uh, North America. I got into to binding tools. and. Uh, and started getting into like um, doing some cool things. This one here has a thermometer and a compass on it. Um, but this one here was where I started to have some fun. And it was like, what can you hide inside products? And, and I, <laughs> I like this idea of people discovering a product. Um, this particular one is a marijuana pipe. It's a little hole up there. That's, now, it looks like a whistle. We designed it as a whistle, sold it as a whistle. Um, but that's the carb and the. Anyway, so <laughs> <coughs> I'm starting to have fun with design and, uh, and seeing that you can like, engage with people through design. And, and I'm starting to see now as product development as actual emotional connection with people. But some, a big shift started to happen for me. And now it's like it wasn't about ideas anymore. Now the, a question came in, if I'm going to have an idea, it might as well be a big one, right? D designing that tool, the amount of effort, being in Taiwan, sitting with the factory guys, putting their tobacco in there to test it, um, that's, that's snowboarding. That's like 25, 30,000 tools. Where could I direct myself now to have bigger impact? And I thought the home market. There's no multifunctional tools for the home, right? Swiss Army knife for Leatherman is not going to help me hang a picture. So I started a new brand, a new company, and I invented this tool, which I have one here, and I can show you guys quickly. Um, it's an urban multi-tool. You remember the key? Snaps open. <laughs> it's got a flashlight. It's got levels. There's like more bits. The measuring tape is in there and a uh, little hammering surface on the bottom there. Yeah. So I thought, great, I've got a home run idea. I spent the last of my money on it and uh, was not going to give up on this one. But now I'm starting to realize that now what I'm doing here is connecting with people. Because the more people that like my idea, they, um, and I'm thinking you know, around the world, this is a way I could actually connect with people in all languages around the world. Um, I, this is me. I was, um, got on the TV show Dragon's Den, and this is me just after I came out of there. Um, and yeah, just nailed it. My ask was $200,000. They offered me back $400,000, and then I went to the back room, and I came back, and I did one of the craziest things I've ever done. I counted back for half a million dollars. 
And um, I didn't, um, I almost didn't get it, but the deal ended up closing. Um, this here, what you're gonna see is an update because that was an awesome deal, but it didn't close, but it was better that it didn't actually close. So here's a little update of what happened with Dragon's Den. You're always asking about pictures from the past seasons of Dragon's Den. Now it's time to check in on one. Last season, Kevin Roy's of Vancouver pitched his handy multi-tool called the Kelvin 23. It's like having an entire toolbox in the palm of your hand. Okay, that's a cool tool. And thanks to a nod of approval from Debbie Travis. Oh my gosh. This is the Swiss Army knife yeah. for home decoration. Kevin nailed a deal with Robert, Jim, and Arlene. Done deal? Done deal. All right, all right. Wow. <laughs> All right. Yeah. A few months later, negotiations derailed oh in due diligence. God. The original deal hit a distribution challenge. We couldn't overcome it, and the whole thing fell apart. Love it. But the pieces came together. In a surprising twist, Brett stepped in. The deal failed. I read about it in the newspaper. I had told Kevin on screen, if this doesn't close, you let me know. Brad calls me up, and now here we are doing the deal. And his new partner brings more than money. Well, let's go sell some. Yeah, thanks a lot, Brad. This belongs in every kitchen, right. in every condo, mm -hmm. every boat, every car. And now there's nothing stopping Kevin. Since the Dragon's Den, the sales have exploded. We've been doing home shows across Canada, Canadian Tire, we're talking with Home Depot. We expect we're gonna be five times up in sales over last year. This is a dream come true, coming true. You know, look where we are now. Imagine where we're gonna be in a year from now. Well done. <laughs> that was, that was awesome. fun. Good. <laughs> yeah, awesome. So that ended up actually working out super good because it's better to work with one dragon than three. And Brett Wilson is, he's a socially conscious entrepreneur and totally inspiring, awesome guy to be around. So that roller coaster, it's a roller coaster. You know, I, I did the deal, I lost it, and then uh, I came back. Um, so a couple things are, are kind of going for me at this point. It's a big thing, if you're gonna have an idea, it might as well be a big one. And then I'm, I, I just started kind of um, looking, at, just sort of like paying attention to how um, the, all the kinds of issues that are going on in the world, too many to mention, but I'm seeing there's a lot of blame on business for that. And then I started to kind of really think about it and see, but wait a second, don't blame the tool, right? It's, the free market isn't the problem. Don't blame the free market. It's, a, it's not a conscious free market, that we're letting companies get away with stuff and we're actually buying the products. And I started to see this link between, wait, it's not Walmart isn't the problem, the problem is, those of us that are walking through the door supporting Walmart. So what I started to click into is that we need a, a free, a conscious free market, not just a conscious entrepreneurs, or, but we need the, the space in the middle to be conscious. And I started getting excited about this um, idea of social enterprise. And so I, I tried my first um, attempt at um, bringing some social initiative into Calvin. And what I did was, uh, every time someone bought a tool, I'd take $5 and I would put it towards uh, making microloans and I focused on women on Kiva. So here I am starting to connect this idea, okay, you like the tool, let's take the tool and give it another value, the social value, so that people are now um, embraced. Um, but the two things have to be there, an uh, awesome product they want and then the changing of the world. Um, but I didn't feel um, thorough about this because this tool is made in China, I've been to the factories where they're pouring aluminum. I wasn't completely proud of it. Um, and so I felt um, dirty, but I'd been uh, ignited now. And now when I look at uh, free market and business, I'm like, there is no other way to be except to have ethics in business. And um, more and more I'm seeing people in this conversation. I'm seeing the organic, um, food sections of my grocery store growing every time I go in there. That means more and more of us are wanting to buy those products, which is giving opportunities for more social entrepreneurs. So where my thinking is at now is, um, first of all, being focused on myself and I wanna live like a, the most fulfilling life I can feel for myself. That's what I want for my kids as well, which means as a rule breaker, what I was finding out is I was continuously saying, I'm not, playing by these rules out here. I'm playing by this rule in here. This is 
how I look at the world. Here's where my decisions come from. And when I was a baby, I was dependent. When I was a teenager, I got my independence. And so in here, was a, a, I'm independent and it's sort of um, claiming my space. Now I see everything as interdependent. And so what's good for me in business only can be something that's going to be good um, for everyone else. Now my focus is on creating initiatives uh, focused on youth and uh, social enterprise and trying to figure out how we can uh, um, spark more socially conscious entrepreneurship as young as possible. And it seems ridiculous to me that if someone goes to get a job and they're 24 as a graphic designer, that the lineage to that job started back in kindergarten when they were doing finger painting. And if you want to get into accounting, that started back in kindergarten when you started working with numbers or writing, right? It starts back there. And then it takes 13, 14, 15 years of training to take a job. But who's training the job makers? Where are the entrepreneurs coming from? It is so hard to become an entrepreneur because it should be starting back there in some way. I don't know what it is yet. I don't know what the finger painting of entrepreneurship is. But that's what I would like to see because I believe the free market, we all live within it and how we spend our money is how I vote. That's how I change the world and I'm watching the world change. Method cleaning products, Tom shoes. I'm watching this happen. Kiva, Kickstarter. So it's going and I just want to participate and be one of those people that helps spread the word. So for me, I know this is what I'm up to, fulfillment. And I think if I'm doing that, I'm better for the world. And I encourage people to be rule breakers in this direction. And I guarantee the result will be you are going to be better for the world and we're going to have a better world for it. Thank you.